So uh, we are now going to begin the panel uh, for question and answers. So if you are a speaker, please uh, feel free to turn your camera on. And um, I'm going to read through some of the questions we've received. And um, if it's to a specific person, I'll let you know. And uh, if it's a broad question, uh, we'll then uh, kind of pass it to whomever wants to answer. So. Um, the first question that I see, if you're ready, is how does Scotch Broom react to fire? And I know we have a fire talk uh, tomorrow, but can anyone give us a preview? Um, well, I, I can answer that. I've, I've said it on fire a few times. Um, it depends on the season and the conditions. Uh, in the spring, early spring actually, uh, there must be an oil or something in the stem, but you can get really tall flame lengths off a of broom in April. Um, in the late summer, uh, it is pretty scary to burn. You can get really tall flame lengths and it will be really hot. Um, and so uh, Nate Johnson will be giving a talk tomorrow and he's going to really go in depth with it, but uh, it definitely can be very volatile fuel to be amongst and to try to manage. Excellent, thank you. So uh, what year do scotch burn plants begin to produce seed? <laughs> well, okay, can I say that I, having followed lots of these and Robert and Jillie can jump in, but uh, it, it it will start to make seeds in year three. It's very extremely rare to ever see a two-year-old plant make a seed. They'll make flowers, but not usually seeds in my experience. Um, and they're way more common. It's way more common to see them making pods in year four than year three. Jill and Robert, have you seen different things at your sites? I haven't properly aged them and when i when i do cut them and grind that grind them they're always much more than four or five years old so but year three okay that's i, I, I want to know how many years early. i would wait a few of them will make a seed in year three but it's really not very common at all like i was trying to say before most of the time they germinate and they're growing for much longer than people think and that's why they tend to think that they make seeds after year two or three really they're older than you think we tend to find plants that have been buried and unburied several times. And so we sometimes don't know how, how old they are that when they are blooming, they're blooming low on a very small plant, but they're actually older than they would seem. That's riverine plants. Nice bird. Great, and I'll, I'll note that I believe we can only show six cameras, but um, the other panelists that aren't shown, um, please feel free to answer. Um, so uh, with that, this is kind of a longer one. Uh, how long after clearing a site of scotch broom can allelopathic chemicals persist in the soil and continue to disrupt the native plant establishment? Sarah. Yeah. That's your dissertation. Yeah, I that one. We don't know. Allelopathy is really hard to measure in the soil and the technology isn't really there yet. We've done some, um, we've definitely done some experiments where we um, have, have added the chemical from, from scotch broom to the soil and measured its impacts but we can't then pull the chemical back out of the soil to see how long it, it sticks around in the soil. So we don't really know how long allelopathy sticks around or, or spartine sticks around in the soil. Okay. Do you have anything to add, Ingrid? Well, I just, um, in your removals, when we tracked what was going on um, in communities after you removed broom, you saw, um, really long legacy effects, kind of like what Adam was seeing. But a lot of that was driven by nitrogen in the system promoting invasive grasses, um, kind of along the lines of what Adam was talking about. So there are, it's kind of hard to separate those chemical effects from some of these other indirect effects, also the microbial ones that you've studied. Right. Great, so, <clears throat> 
uh, follow-up question, are there uh, native plant species that have shown resistance to scotch fir melulopathy? <coughs> I think David Carter actually had something on this on a paper or manuscript. So I think there was a grass. I want to say Elimus glaucus, but I'm really not sure. But I think David Carter would be the person to ask on that. I have a follow-up question for Adam on this topic, which is you talked about community composition shifts kind of overall. But what have you noticed about the individual species, the individual species that are associated with Scotch broom legacies as opposed to other communities. Um, the so sweet vernal grass was one of the strong indicator species for legacy uh, areas. Um, native species uh, fescue did not fescue didn't like legacy areas uh, or areophyllum or microsoft Basically, all of the native perennial forbs, um, except for uh, viola, dunca, and brodea. Um, they actually were somewhat more present in the legacy soils, um, at least at this one site. Um, of non-native species, uh, it was really the exotic grasses. Uh, hairy cat's ear was less prevalent in legacy soils than um, not, which is actually pretty great. I was really worried that it was going to be this fusion of hypocras and Scots broom, and we would just probably want to give up. Um, and the, some of the exotic annuals seem to be a little bit more present in the um, legacy soils, but it wasn't a strong effect. And again, it was just one site. So, uh, in, in would, other, oh, sorry. Oh no, that's all I got. I was going to say in others in other systems, people have found that one of the ways that allelopathy operates is by disruption of mycorrhizal fungi, mm -hmm. and um, they have found that. Um, garlic mustard, there's lots and lots of work how garlic mustard in, leaves legacies and through the disruption of mycorrhizae. And it sort of seems like that species that are highly dependent on mycorrhizal fungi are the ones that are the least likely to, or the most likely to be impacted. And the species that are the least dependent on their mycorrhizal fungi are the most likely to do well in mm -hmm. um areas that have been hammered by an allelopathic species but mm -hmm. in in our system we don't know which species are we don't know that their their relative dependence on mycorrhizae but that's something to think about if you do oh, know uh, those things when uh we did have one americorps uh member Stu Olveski. he did a project uh looking at camas and he he actually found that um, on legacy soils, camas actually was a little bit bigger and flowered a little bit more in terms of the number of flowers than a non-legacy. It was a small effect, but it, it, it was persistent, which I thought was pretty interesting because I would have expected the opposite. So it's complicated. You know, it's individual species. Yeah. And Adam, with that, um, with that response, there was no other variable like more water or? Um, we didn't, uh, I didn't measure soil moisture or anything like that. Um, we did do like bulk density and some nitrogen, but uh, we didn't see a strong difference in those variables. Uh, Interesting. So that doesn't mean they're not there. You just mm -hmm. it. <coughs> It, this kind of reminds me of the Brady Bunch, the way my screen is set up, by the way. <laughs> um, so uh, just a quick comment. Uh, someone asked if we might consider doing a conference on Recon area grass in the future. And yes. I would definitely like to say that um, we would love to get that kind of feedback and definitely email that to uh, the Invasive Species Council or put it in the in the in the question box, but um, the Invasive Species Council is interested in responding to other types of issues and bringing together researchers and managers. So um, possibly, and it sounds like Jill has interest. Yeah. I'm proposing that we do a Reed Canary Grass Work Symposium similar to this one and for probably not 2020, but definitely for 2021. 
So I'll be working with Justin, who who will ever call, ask that question, and everyone else who's interested. And I've already lined up a lot of speakers and um, interested in getting more. Nice. Great. Well, I look forward to not doing that in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> not doing it in 2020. Maybe we'll Great. even do it in person in 2021. Wouldn't that be astonishing? Or maybe we'll do it both ways, right? Now that we've learned how to do this so well. Yeah, but definitely, uh, if anyone else has ideas, we're we're open to these suggestions. I know that um, Ilanthus, like Tree of Heaven, has been a big topic lately, with the Nexus Two Spotted Lanternfly, and um, I think that the Invasive Species Council in Washington, I won't speak for the other areas, is interested in convening this kind of group. So um, let us know. And uh, I had to rush my talk, and I apologize because I was going to give a shout out to a lot of the great conversations that I had during the census. One of which that was most exciting for me personally was uh, a gentleman named Marvin that was very interested in starting a new volunteer group uh, in Pierce County to deal with Broome. And um, I'm really excited to see that this census might prompt uh, new action and new volunteer groups. Um, but I'm happy that Martin was a Marvin was able to join. And he asked, Jill mentions that there are three different types of Scotch broom. Does the individual who is interested in removing the broom need to differentiate between the types? Um, that wasn't me. Maybe that was Ingrid. Might have been when we were talking about how you tell the difference between Scotch broom, gorse, and Spanish broom. Mm -hmm. um, gorse, we can take all of them out. <laughs> it's all good to, to take all of them. Gorse is really tricky because it's got those spines. So the gorse is really hard to do with volunteers in particular yeah, because it's I don't really, suggest it. It's really nasty and awful. Spanish mm -hmm. broom is usually not as big of a problem. What do you guys see up there? Justin, Jill? The Spanish broom? Um agree. I've personally I, found one in my lifetime, but I yeah. think it's far less common. <laughs> it's down here, but it's mostly in California where I am, but it's mostly along roadsides and it's really mm -hmm. um but people will grow it in their garden and so you don't yeah. You don't we've have to get all aggressive with people who have one in their garden. <laughs> right. We've we've got it on the coast in a number of different sites and it and it is being controlled, but the seed bank is so long lived longer than scotch broom. Um, and it is such a tricky plant to deal with. You really have to be suited up and we do cut stump treatment on it. So that's something that I don't tend to do with volunteers either. But the other ones, absolutely. And just keep going back and back and back and back. Right, everybody? <laughs> back and back and back, yes. Down here, we have a big problem with French broom, actually, mm -hmm. and as you get farther down, you know, into Northern California, and so French broom is a huge problem here, and right. I just pulled up about 200 of them yesterday, so. See? I was thinking of you, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> Think of all those seeds you stopped. Thank you, Ingrid. You're awesome. Great. Well, uh, we've got 15 minutes, and we've got a ton of questions. Uh, a question, do, uh, does Washington have a list of economic impacts for all weeds in Washington state? And um, the, the answer is no. Uh, in 2017, the Invasive Species Council and state agencies looked at 22 different species and, um, and, and projected the impact of either introduction or spread if it was present. And so uh, if you want to see that, go to invasive species, period, WA is in Washington, period, GOV is in government, and under reports, uh, it's listed. And um, it's plants, animals, and uh, insects. And so um, it it's, uh, doesn't include every noxious weed, for example. I think there's over 200 now, um, but it includes some of the, the big heavy hitters. Uh, and the council would definitely be interested if we didn't include one species and there's a need to do it, um, would be open to taking that feedback. And Oregon's has, uh, in 2002, 2000, Troy, you could answer this, did 100 species and then revisited it in 2012. Oh, wow. I'm not sure if they have the 100 or not.
And Troy had to join an Oregon Invasive Species Council meeting, unfortunately. Okay. Didn't, I can't see him, so may as well move ahead. Um, let's see. So I think this question is for you, Adam. Uh, what type of plant stock was used for replanting, uh, bare root or plugs? I guess that could have been Sarah's as well. Uh, mostly seed, a little bit of plugging but primarily it was broadcast sown fescue and areophyllum and some of the more common furry plants back then. Now we do a huge mix of broadcast seeding, hand seeding, uh, and plugging. We pretty much don't do any bare root work on the prairies. I bet that question was for me because there's always a lot of debate on whether, when and what, when to use a uh, bare root versus um, plugs. And I think that there's some um, idea that for those drought prone sites in the South Sound area, that it can be beneficial to use plugs as opposed to um, bare root. But we always use bare root because we're often interested in mycorrhizae um, and other soil microbes and the bare root come I'm sorry, the plugs come with their own soil and we don't want mm -hmm. their soil. We like to have them bare yeah. roots so we can they can get the yeah. the microbes that are in the soil that we plant them into. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've had terrible success plugging in the South Sound. Yeah, maybe that's why. Yeah. <laughs> they got those weenie microbes from the nurseries. Yeah. Great. Uh, this next one is directed to uh, uh, Paul Pratt, I'm going to turn my camera off, Paul, so you can turn yours on and um, and address the question if you're still here. I'm here. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing the question now. Uh, feel free to turn your camera on if you'd like to, sir. Um, so is it's it on. Okay. Is it possible to begin the process of spreading the gall mites now, or will that be possible in the future? And can this be done? by volunteers under the supervision of trained personnel and what kind of the permitting needs would there be? Yeah, so this is my understanding. I don't know if Jennifer is on as long as she might be able to comment or she might say something tomorrow. I think she's speaking then. Um, so for movement of mite, uh, you really do need a federal permit to redistribute the mite, especially across state lines. But because it was, in, you know, it, it arrived, no one knows how it got here, no one knows um, uh, you know, the history on its arrival necessarily. Uh, so I think um, as a federal employee, I would not recommend its redistribution until there is an official permit to move it from uh, property to property or across state lines. So right now it's prohibited. I guess one caveat, there may be some state county rules that I'm not aware of. Uh, and so some of the folks that are more familiar with that local legislation might uh, might be able to chime in. And and I'll, since Jen isn't on today, I'll just add. This is Jill. I have my camera turned off, but um, um, I I'm just going to add that we've distributed two different kinds of scotch broom, other bi biocontrols, the the weevils, and um, with w, WSDA's support, sending out an intern with bugs and mm -hmm. we've gone back and collected them again. So anybody who wants to distribute the ones that are approved can call Jen and she'll be presenting I tomorrow. She'll definitely be presenting tomorrow. Thank you. Correct. Yes. Uh, Jen will be presenting tomorrow and it sounds like there's a lot of interest in this. So thanks, Paul. Um, let's see. So this has to do with fire effects. Uh, there's some research that that's looking at intensity of fire and low intensity fires might actually increase scotch firm germination. Do any of you have any comments on that? Well, we Adam? definitely see seedlings after low intensity fire than a high intensity fire. I mean, we if we're in our sites that are really heavily infested, we try to burn it really hot and intense to try to kill the seed bank. Um, but especially on the prairies, if we're burning in this shoulder season, I mean, the moss, you can you can burn the above ground vegetation and the ground is can be wet 
Um, and I mean, those are perfect conditions for germination of most things. So um, mm -hmm. I, I did would an say experiment. Oh, I did an experiment on this many years ago where with um, JBLM personnel who were my fire guys and we uh, burned meter diameter circles where we either put the scotch firm seeds in first and then burned them or we burned them and then put the scotch firm seeds in after. And those were in prairie sites, kind of like yours, Adam. And um, we found that, because we were curious about whether it was burning the moss that would maybe flush out the seedlings or if it was the actual fire effects themselves. And what we found was a bit of both that you got um, more scotch firm germination in burned circles than in controls, but you got even more if you put the seeds in before before the burning. So there was a stimulation of the seeds as well as kind of a setting the stage for, for um, really good germination conditions. Um, this is Jill. I'm just going to pop in because I noticed there's a chat message from Jen Andres, and I'm going to read it. Permits are required to interstate travel, but not intrastate state travel, still not recommended within the state. In addition, it is also very challenging to distribute, so success is unlikely. Let me know if you want me to add a comment tomorrow. Not sure it will be the same audience. Thanks, Jen. And as for the burned one, there actually was an experiment. Uh, Srinivas Srinivasan et al. 2012 actually did an experiment uh, in India on fire and broom and found that fire makes it much worse, and it also brings gorse, and also there are tigers in the gorse. <laughs> I felt that last part was very well. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so uh, we might get into this a little more tomorrow, but um, pulling versus cut stump treatment, I'm assuming like treating with whoppers, not whoppers and herbicide, um, but the person might want to follow up if, if I'm not capturing that. Um, does one create more seed germination than another. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Sarah's laughing because we did that experiment too. We were very curious about the fact that you get these like incredible lawns of scotch broom seedlings coming up oftentimes after control. And we were wondering whether it was had to do with disturbing the soil, you know, because we all debate like if we pull the broom up, is that going to make the germination worse? Um, so we compared places where we um, had disturbed the soil and to places where we uh, herbicided out the broom and just opened up the space. And we found that, that it was very interesting. We were super surprised that um, we could get a flush of new seedlings of broom just by removing, carefully removing the overstory of broom, even without disturbing the soil. So it made us think that there's some strong competition between bigger broom and broom seedlings um, that doesn't require disturbance. I don't know if that's getting at the question, but it is kind of a relevant thing. This is Jill, and we see a variety of responses, but cut stump treatment to us, Justin means cutting and dripping um, aquatic glyphosate on the cut stump with, with blue dye and water. And um, just cut stump out where we have so much water in the soil doesn't work generally. Usually it resprouts, so we don't do that anymore. Pulling definitely results in a big flush of seedlings where there's been a lot of seed dropped. And these are really nutrient poor soils normally, not forest soils so much because we're working in riverine gravel bar or silt floodplain environments. But um, I understand your the response you saw, um, Ingrid and Sarah. And I, I do think the amount of water that is present has a lot to do with what sprouts back and it, the, and the other thing that we see is when we cut, so we go through and we don't pull seedlings in the river bars because we have to carry them out so that the river doesn't capture them and replant them. So we don't pull them, we let them grow another year. And yes, as soon as we remove the big ones and leave the seedlings alone, they grow three feet and out three feet in one season in response to being released. Thanks. And we've um, tried, um, so as Catherine Dufresne, she found that these, we found these cut plants and they had re-sprouted multiple stems like cupicing, basically. Uh, she called them the hydra. 
because you you didn't kill them, you just made them mad. And they actually had an increase in the number of seed pods per unit mass after the cut and allowed to cut piece. So please drip the glyphosate on them, please. It's you true, but I'll have to, the stems. I have to add that it's, it is variable across sites. Yeah, We've had yeah. some sites where their resprout rates are incredibly low, you know, lower than 10%. So I think it's not, it's not always that it's not always true although sometimes it is in, in a big way we found on prairies just cutting it, it's not particularly successful because you do get those like bushy plants that are almost impossible to pull um we sort of do a combination of burning uh and then waiting until it starts to resprout and then spraying the resprout and then just repeating that over and over and over again and that's been pretty successful. We've also been able to spray in the winter with success um, with Garlon 4. Um, so that's another thing that we found is, is the burn and herbicide is a pretty good combination, at least in the prairies. Great. Well, th thanks everyone. We um, have uh, plenty more questions and um, we're going to export the questions and then we'll send that to the presenters. And um, if they have answers, we'll, we'll send you an email with the response. And um, I think that the general theme is that we want this conversation to continue. And so um, if you have comments that you think about tonight or questions uh, based about what you're going to be hearing tomorrow, or on day three, uh, definitely let us know and we'll be happy to, to connect you with these researchers so that we can continue the discussion. Um, we've seen a lot of great research uh, findings in how scotch broom impacts soil, how it impacts pollinators, um, some, some really interesting research on mites and how the scotch broom might, um, might uh, be helpful in, in controlling some broom. Um, we're really all, all looking forward to learning more about biological control tomorrow from Jen Andres. Um, some of my notes that I captured is that there is some research gaps and some actions we need to think about. Um, a genetic study is something that Dr. Parker pointed out. I think that'd be really interesting. Um, talking uh, with Sarah Grove in the past, uh, we had thought that there might be some research gaps in fire and fuels. So, um, we definitely want to connect with with Adam Martin and keep that conversation going. And I know the Department of Natural Resources has some kilns uh, for fire fuels measurement. So maybe we can help uh, solve that problem. And um, I think that, you know, this is just a really great conversation. And I uh, uh, realize that there have been a lot of comments about the percentage of which Washington is infested with scotch broom and the scotch broom census just ended so we haven't crunched any numbers yet uh, the very uh, broad county level map if you took the minimum threshold of those categories that would be 16,000 acres we all know there's much more uh, but we don't know how much and we hope that we are going to answer that question once we dig into the census results so stay tuned uh, and maybe I'll, we should think about a follow-up webinar about the census results um, just so that we can convey the findings to everybody. So stay tuned, sign up for our newsletter if you have an interest, and um, we will reconvene tomorrow uh, to continue the discussion. So thank you all so much, and uh, thank you to the presenters. It's been really great um, seeing you all, and we look forward to seeing you in person when we do this the next time. So thanks, everyone.